One, we welcome you to the uh, coffee with the managers. I'm not a manager, but, um, and I'm not Laura. <laughs> Laura is, uh, is ill, and, um, and she could not make it today, so she asked me to sit in on her, and I promise that I will not get as uh, excited as I did last time. Um, she, she gave me a few notes that she wanted uh, me to put out there for you. Um, there have been some questions concerning both the county and the city as to preserving businesses in the area. And there's been a lot of concerns because we've had some businesses that have closed down recently and, and I think it's important for everyone to know that businesses close for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, sometimes they're underfunded. It, it's a great idea to start a business, but you have to have have capital to start off with so that you can successfully navigate through those first few months or maybe the first year of business to establish yourself. And sometimes businesses have closed in our area because of, of divorce, not because of the business itself uh, being unsuccessful, but because uh, the owners uh, were in the process of, of separation. We've also had people that have retired. Um, we've had uh, Patty's Hallmark that uh, 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 closed after many, many years. So I, I can't tell you how many um, apology cards I have bought from them, uh, from my wife. And um, they tried to sell their business and they even had a buyer for it, but they could not they could not get uh, the credit that they needed to be able to purchase the business. And so there's a number of reasons. Now, there are things that we can do to help businesses ourselves, and that's to shop locally. Because I hear a lot of people tell me, um, oh, I'm going to Albuquerque, I'm going to Costco to buy my groceries, I'm, I'm gonna do this. Now, I understand saving money, I do. But every time we make purchases in Gallup or in Albuquerque, we are benefiting their economy. And it kind of um, uh, hurts our economy just a little bit. And so that's something that we can do. We can shop locally. Of course, I expect all businesses to be competitive and, and to, you know, to be on top of their game, to give good service and, and uh, to be worthy of the, of the clients and customers that come to them. And so the city of Grants is very concerned about this and we do work closely with, with businesses. Um, I know in my office of code enforcement, um, a lot of times we're the first people that, um, the first office that a new business owner comes to, to get their permits and, and I'll tell you, we throw the red carpet out for them because we want to encourage business in our communities. And, and so I, I know that there have been some that have been concerned about this and concerned that we're not doing enough, but uh, it's not government's job to be in control of someone's business. And uh, you, uh, Barbara. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, a lot of our youngsters are not coming in and wanting to stay in grants and we're not training our young people to take on the responsibilities of business and that's one of our biggest challenges is that they're wanting to go away and we're we as a community are not doing that parents grandparents we're not encouraging our youngsters to develop business skills we're not encouraging them to do that to stay here and look for those opportunities right here so we're at fault in many ways for not encouraging our youngsters to see the opportunities because there are many opportunities in our community. I think that's very important. Um, I know that in my home with my children, we have from the time that they were young and we have nine children, we, we would sit around the table and we would lay out um, all our bills and we would uh, let them know how much my wife and I were bringing in for income. And then we would go through and we would add up the bills and we would add up how much we made. 
and how much we had to pay. And there were some times when we had to make choices. And so I'd ask the children, so what do you think of all these, these things, um, you know, food, uh, utilities, cable, um, internet, uh, what do you think needs to go? And they would, uh, they would make the decision. They would say, and, and there were quite a few times when they said, well, let's cut the cable. That's so much a month and we don't need that. And, and we can cut this and maybe we could trim off our food budget. And then we would all uh, vote on it. And, uh, and then everyone was on board. Um, part of our problem is that we do not have enough big business in our, in our county to keep our young people, you know? And, and that's something that we've been trying to work on. And uh, our minds are open and our efforts are, are constant in trying to bring big business into the area, so yeah. Well, also to keep the young people in the city of I can't that. wait until it's my turn. I've got this wonderful idea. <laughs> because that's what we need to keep them here. We don't, you know, there's nothing here for them to do on their downtime, you know, when they're off work. Or I, I, I want to say also, too, another good thing for kids to do, especially when they're in high school, is to get a job. And I hear people say, well, there are no jobs. There are jobs. There are lots of jobs out there that, that kids could apply for and work. And I think it's important that we teach our youth a work ethic. I know we handle, our city has the community service um, uh, program where uh, the courts um, bring uh, people to our office that, that cannot pay their own fines and court costs. And so the judge orders them to do community service. And we, we oversee that program sign off on all their work, assign their work, and then make sure that they do it. And I have been kind of surprised when someone has said to me, you mean we have to pick up trash? Or we have to take care of the animals or, or something like that. I'm always surprised when I hear you say that. Um, I just would like to add to that conversation. Um, so I work at NMSU. And you know we're not alone in having our young people flee. I wanted to flee my little hometown that was smaller than Milan, and I did. And I, you know, I'm not back yet. But anyway, um, we see that at the college a lot. But what I'm amazed at, and I've been there 16 years now, there is a segment of people that want to stay in France, and especially with our Native American people, they want to stay in the area close to their family. And you know, Melinda Montano, she. Um, is an example of she's got a bachelor's in business, she got it through MSU, and, and she finally was able to get her own building and her business. And we have teachers and nurses that you know, they want to stay in Grant. So it's, I, don't, I don't want us to think this all or nothing, but we're right. We do need to continue to create reasons why people want to stay in Savoia County. And many people leave and come back. So um, I just want us to keep that perspective. Oh, I agree. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to also add that. Um, we do have businesses opening. I mean, we have, I, I know we've had some high profile businesses close recently, but we also have businesses that are applying for licenses all the time. We have a, a pawn shop that will be opening on First Street. We have a physical therapy uh, building. They rehab the complete uh, gas company building and turned it into a beautiful building. They paved the parking lot they, um, they've done a great job. And so that's gonna be a very nice physical uh, therapy uh, center. We've got, we've got other businesses too, a uh, beauty parlor that is being built in, um, it's a full service uh, at the old Falcomata um, property on Santa Fe Avenue. They will be do, doing hair, they'll also be doing massages and nails and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, there's also been movement over at the, um, the Red Lion Hotel property. I've noticed that they've had contractor trucks over there and they've been busy working on the parking lot and inside the building. And I would imagine that eventually they're gonna reopen that building again. And um, 
Uh, Laura wanted me to mention also that, that the city contributes to the Cibola Economic Development Foundation and funds um, Eileen Yarborough's um, uh, economic development team. Um, they attend several trade shows across the country to make potential business prospects aware of our community and invite them to consider grants. The board meets every month to discuss ways we can support local business development. Terry Fletcher is on that board. Um, we contribute, uh, let's see, we have listed potential uh, business ideas on our website to inform the public of types of business that we feel are lacking and we have market for. We started the food truck Monday, Friday, to spur some synergy downtown. We have initiated the ordinance to create a film friendly community. And it's true, um, they have really reached out to the uh, New Mexico Film Commission. There are like 82 different projects going on around the state that bring in about $162 million in revenue to different communities. And in the past, we have not been getting that revenue. And so they, they took pictures of the area, they, they've sent, they filled out all the paperwork and we are on the list uh, for possible areas to shoot commercials, to shoot TV series or uh, movies. And I think that was an important step forward. Uh, we work directly um, to develop friendly franchise agreements with the local internet providers. One of the big things that has happened in this community, and I'm grateful to Continental Divide and, and also to uh, Sacred Winds for providing better internet service, but we're getting broadband throughout the area, which is going to be a big, big difference in the service that we have, which will open up new opportunities with the internet. Um, any questions? One more comment. No Denise, comment, please. Denise Chavez is normally here, and she's the Small Business Development Center director. And it's too bad she's not here for this. But um, what I also see, and I'm no business expert, but sure. you know, I've read that many small businesses, it takes like five years before they see a profit. And um, many do not even have a basic business plan. And that's how the Small Business Development Center can help. And Denise has told me that many people are very resistant to going to get help. So I think that as we talk with new business owners or people wanting to go into business, we need to encourage them to access those kinds of services so they can be real intentional, real intelligent, real smart about how they're going to go into business. I, I want, oh, Barbara. May I comment to that? For years, literacy volunteers attempted to offer financial literacy. People are reluctant, reluctant to reveal any of their financial things or even their, the things that they need because we are a gossiping community and whatever is told to one person gets spread like wildfire fire all over the community and we need to, when someone tells us something in confidence, we need to keep that confidential and we're not that community, we just spread it all over. And so people are, know this and they're very reluctant to go to someone like Denise who's very confident and able to help people, but they're afraid that their information is going to be broadcast. Um, one of the projects that the city is uh, starting is uh, new lighting around the uh, streets, Robert and Vicki, that go um, up to Walmart. That area has always been kind of dark and scary, and they're planning on putting in sidewalks, um, which will make it more attractive uh, we have more people come to Walmart than anywhere else in, in grants. And I think it's important, we've been working with the uh, different business owners to keep their properties up. We only have one particular uh, business that I have a constant problem with, but we're, we're wor working on that all the time. Try to make things look better in our community. Our, our weed abatement program has been very successful. Um, yes, we haven't had we haven't had the rain that we've had uh, in the past, but um, the eradication of the uh, Russian uh, thistle has been successful. The spraying has helped. Our streets look a lot better, and um, and I'm, I'm grateful to everyone in the community that steps up and helps. Um, just 
the other day I was driving down the street down Sacalaris and I saw Steve Owens out with a big bag and he was out picking up garbage and um, I stopped and I talked with him for a while you know he's he's on different boards he he contributes his time to a number of different causes um, mainly the um, the airport museum and this man is an engineer and it's he does not consider it beneath him to go out and to to clean up garbage in our community and there are many many others that that we have no idea about because they do not toot their horns they do not put it out there they just quietly go about working and making our communities better and I, I'm all for that. I believe that our clean communities are safer communities and when our communities are clean we will have more people want to come here and spend tourist dollars which benefits our economy um, and then they may want to stay because they see that we have something to offer. We've been doing our best to eradicate graffiti that whenever we get a, a call on graffiti we have it photographed, cataloged and then I put it on the Cibola Awareness site and people have been a little, you know, have uh, criticized that. They said, well, we don't want that out there. And, but it's been a good thing. And I can tell you this, the citizens have been stepping up and reporting the people that are actually doing the graffiti. Now for a, a community the size of Grants, we've done a pretty good job. That, that graffiti comes down within 24 hours we do not leave it up and I know I live in Milan and I love living in Milan but we have a problem with graffiti there and so Grants has done a really good job at doing that and we're encouraging that in all the communities that uh, that are around our county to do that I know we had our our 10th uh, county cleanup uh, I'm sorry to be getting into this but we had our 10th cleanup in San Fidel uh, recently that was such a great experience. And they also, um, they were so happy with the cleanup that they painted a building that they had problems with graffiti in their town. We did the same thing in Cabrera. And after that, they went and they painted all their walls that are white that were covered with graffiti. To, um, you know, people want to clean their communities and they want to, they want to have a place to be proud of. And um, the city of Grants, is dedicated to that and and we're doing all that we can to make our community a better community i'll turn the time over to kate thank you it's kind of weird having my boss on my left and finance on my right and, yeah okay i wanted to bring up because we had a long discussion about students and young people and keeping them in um here keeping them one want, wanting to be in here and all these comments were absolutely correct. I mean, that's what you have to think about. You know, how do you do this? How can we, what if we do this? How are we going to do it? So one of the things is thinking outside the box. Um, we, have, we have a university here. We have a high school. We have students that are there working, want to learn. Um, the, I spoke to the superintendent at the high school. And he's very interested. I asked him if he would be willing to look into it. I want to start a program with the seniors to have them come to the government buildings and work in our departments. We will pay them. Um, it, I've done this before and it was a huge success. And you talk about people not knowing what we do as a government and what, we, what uh, each department is and what they do to get to Plan Z. Okay, so um, I have seen students like learn so much that they've actually changed their major when they go to school, when they go to university. Um, I've seen students come back and say, I know what I want to do now. You know, I want to work in finance. I want to work in government. You know, government is always such a scary thing sometimes because we have so many regulations. But we need to start thinking outside the box. We need to start working together and seeing how we can, you know, yes, students need to go and live their life and have experiences. but. This is a lovely place to grow, you know, to, to live. And we just need to give them the opportunity to learn what they want to do. Some of these students don't know until they actually have an experience of saying, 
if they're in a department and they learn about spreadsheets and finance, it gets them, I assure you, they are so quick on the computer, they, they actually assisted me so much because they're not scared of the computer. So it was a really neat experience for me and I, I'm, I'm hope the superintendent was very interested in it. So I think if I could start there, then we'll kind of move forward. So I just want to kind of give you that update because I, I think it will be worth, worth it. Okay, so we're really busy. Again, budget approved. Uh, after I talk, I'm going to turn it over to Paul because he's been doing some really good factual information and I hope that he will explain it to all of us. Um, we have new auditors. Our auditor, our audit has um, been released. It was disclaimed, which is the worst of the worst. Um, we knew this. It was seven, this is 17's audit. Um, but I do have some good news, kind of. Sort of, yeah, very good news. So when you're disclaimed, it is the worst audit that you could ever have. It is saying you do not know how to take care of your money. So when that came, we had to, I was thinking two years, because it's basically, if it's disclaimed, usually in government, we're in the corner for two years. We won't be able to be fiscal agents for anything. We won't be able to get loans. We won't be able to get grants. And so my mind was set on how to get through the two years so we could get ready. I have a new finance person working and learning about audits, getting a new auditor. So our audit was released. Rick Lopez is our director of DFA. And uh, we get this, Paul gets his email because we're trying to figure out how to pay fiscal agents. We have to ask for another entity to be our fiscal agent. Two weeks ago, I had to go to McKinley at the commission meeting and beg so we could keep the project going because we couldn't, I thought we couldn't be a, um, a fiscal agent. But because of what's been going on and all the employees working together and, and doing the things that need to be done and learning, we have a letter from DFA saying that we, do, we can be our own fiscal agent, even if we have a disclaimed audit. And that is huge. That helps everyone. That helps us um, look at more projects, possibilities. We don't have to go and pay somebody from admin fees. We can do it. Capital appropriations that were given to us before this all blew up, um, it, was a, it was for uh, sheriff's vehicles and for road. We, we, will have to, we would have had to go out and pay for an administrator to administer fiscal agent's responsibilities to those two capital appropriations, and now we can do it in-house. So that is huge, and people are talking, saying, wow, a disclaimed audit, and we still can be, um, and this is because we have strong people, and we've also got hard workers, and we work as a team, and I think that's a lot to do with it. We have commissioners that support us, um, which is huge, you know, it's back and forth. We might not agree all the time, but they, I hope that I'm giving them the information so they can make some good decisions. Saying that, last meeting, the commission had some really dis difficult decisions to make. They had to, um, we had some written requests for entities that would need money for the, and you know, usual requests like library, extension services, all these people that come on a regular basis which is actually great because that's what gov government wants to help. But sometimes government can't help because we don't have the money. So unfortunately, the commission had, the dis had to make those choices and I did feel sorry for them because I gave them the information, I gave them the facts, and we basically didn't have very much um, wiggle room to give more money. And I also m gave them a quality to quantity, what do you want? Our budgets are clean, we have our numbers, we know how much that we can spend. Our proof budget is, we know the revenue, we know the expenditures. You can, you can give this money to our local entities, or you can address it as a employee's um, gratitude and working for the county. I haven't found the last time we actually had a pay raise, the employees did, not me, but the employees. I've gone back 12 years and still no, I haven't seen any pay raise. So with the help of Paul, we gave the commission what ifs, you know, if we can do this, you're going to have this much left for our general fund. 
So, ev so they all knew what they were going to decide to do. So we split that up to they decided they voted on the three entities that they gave the funding to, and then they decided to look and see how we can do this pay raise. Remember, no pay raise for over 12 years. We have the lowest paid dispatchers in the state. They work as an emergency service for all of us. They work blind, and we are paying them $10. Right? That is awful. So because we've got the budget set, because we know our numbers and the audit is going, our next forecasted job is to review policies, to re review job descriptions, reclassify some positions so we're at a, a level of fairness. Uh, there's been big issues about the sheriff not being able to hire because they're low. Um, they are low. They're not the lowest, but the commission voted to approve 10% pay raise to all certified officers. And they knew if they did that, they knew that they would have this much money in the general fund. So it was a what if. Someone, some commission, commissioner asked Paul, look and see how much money it would be if we did a $2 raise. So everybody was talking to the commissioners and they came to us and that's what they need to do to get the facts so they can make the decisions. So I thought it was a hard commission meeting. It was. I felt for them because it is hard to say no all the time and I think they did really well in, in leveling it out and appreciating the staff. Um, when I walked in there five, six months ago, the staff looked like they had been beaten up. I mean, they were so low that it took me at least three weeks just to be able to ask them and them giving me an answer. The first question I asked was, what do you like about grants and Cibola? Why, why do you love Cibola, right? Did I say that? M Mr. Dodds was there and I got nothing. Did I say, did I get nothing? Absolutely no answer. It was just blank. And that had a lot to do with how they had been treated, how they had been, they've gone through, when, when you get told on a weekly basis that you're going to lose your job, imagine how they've been feeling. So with this and how much work they've worked, they, they trusted me, they trusted the commission, they did it with us, we have meetings, and uh, you know, I can, I can guarantee you if I ask them what they, what they love about Cibola, it would be a different, totally different scenario. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of where we're going. We have three buildings, three huge buildings. We have the old court building in 515, we have the detention center that's closed. We also, so we don't use the detention center, but we have to pay for electric and all the utilities because it's connected to the sheriff's office on the right and the magistrate on the left. We also have a <coughs> building that we, and we're not full there. We're not even two thirds full of that huge building. So we've come to a, an issue that we've got three big buildings, we're paying for utilities, and none of them are full. So we're paying so much for utilities that it's embarrassing and we have to consolidate, have to. We have to figure out what's the best thing to do because first of all, county should not be realtors and we, we can't keep having empty buildings because we are paying a fortune. So we're working sort of together to figure out facts and find out how much each building is costing we have, we've taken tours, there's some people that might be interested in purchasing um, a building, but that's just an ongoing thing, so I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of where we're at. Like I said, our reviewing, we're going to review the personnel policy that's in the ordinance right now. Not that it was a wrong policy, but it's an old one, and we have to update it, because government has unfunded mandates, and they basically have to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. In our old personnel policy, there's a few things that we need to take out, or amend. So the next, after that, we'll be working on the procurement, same thing. Um, procurement has changed drastically from the last four years. Huge, I mean, upside down, you know, so we need to, we need to change our procurement policy. Um, we have a contractor from PTD that's working in the assessor's um, department, and I'm, they're doing great, they're doing really well. We're finding a lot of issues, but we're also solving them and working forward. Um, assessors are really important because 
they have to be able to assess correctly because that's where we get our revenue it's our property taxes and if we can't assess the correct way or not assess we are literally losing money every single year so we need to have that assessors knowledge so they can do their job and help the county um, legislative priorities January doesn't seem too close but it is NMAC which is the New Mexico Association of Counties we have 33 counties that pull together and in there we have affiliates we have different groups like um, managers affiliate we meet together three times a year to figure out what their issues and lo and behold everyone has the same issues across the state so this NMAC hires um, lobbyists and helps us prioritize the commissioner's choice to to go for a bill or approve or disapprove something and they usually have three priorities and they have to vote and the board of directors vote and in the board of directors consists of one elected official from every single county so they are a part of what we do to move forward and you know how you say if everybody's on the same page and saying the same things it's a much better result so that's what we do we prioritize we, we give our information we give our requests we, we tell them what our concerns are and then they vote so we do have three priorities and I'm going to just give you real quick sheriff's office um, all the sheriffs in the state are paying a fortune for transporting state prisoners so the, the counties are are suffering so much because we have to pay for state transport prisoners from one end of the sta uh, county state to the other it's just not right I mean this is a, the state should be taking care of that so we've been bathing that for a couple of years and now it is on our priority list and we're requesting them to make the state pay for our transports from each sheriff's department so that's a good thing another one is um, emergency services EMTs volunteers departments that are in the rural areas especially that don't have funding it, it's in it's backwards we have uh, eight fire departments volunteer and because the fire departments have a work through the PRC which works through the fire marshal they receive on average 60,000 a year 80 130 it depends on where their ISO is but they receive a lot of money so they are always they've got more than a million if you put them all together it's a lot of money and honestly they don't spend it they average 30 percent a year and this is just not this in this county it's everywhere they have too much which is great because they can go buy a fire truck but we have EMS departments that are living on that are receiving seven thousand dollars a year so we have an average we have EMTs that are being called out on a daily basis and fire departments we need to figure out how to help the EMS so this has been on the radar for about four years um, and I'm really glad that they've actually prioritized it this year because we need to make we need to give them more funding so they can be active and learn and have more trainings and, and purchase the needed things to assist us in emergencies so that's what that's the other one and the other one is let me see I've forgotten is the ret detention the detention facilities reimbursement act we don't have to really worry about that we don't have a detention but uh, a lot of money has been taken out when this happened and you close we closed the detention center it wasn't just through a whim it was actually a very good decision counties should not be looking having detention centers they're not they're not set up for it they're not set up to have all the new statutes and regulations we, I'm gonna throw out do you know they have to have a breastfeeding room do you know that if you don't you can get fined as a detention center if you don't have a breastfeeding room these little things that come through counties can't keep up with medical uh, fi um, mental health hospital visits we pay a fortune because as soon as they we arrest we have to take they're not in control of what they do we are so we pay a fortune what was the last big bill that I put across it was like hundred and twenty thousand dollars for an inmates medical it's, it's ridiculous 
So this detention facility, we've all bounded together and say, we, we need to stop this because the counties are suffering, which means that we're not, get, we're not using counties' um, constituents' tax money correctly. We can do more with if we don't have to have unfunded mandates for things that we really shouldn't be paying for. So anyway, there's my spiel. Um, I'm going to move it to Mr. Paul because he's got some good stuff too. Okay. Well, oh, hi, I'm, wait, I'm Paul. Do you have any questions so we don't? I just have a comment yes. about salaries. Uh -huh. um, several months ago, I had done some research on our elected officials. Mm -hmm. And this is not something that the county can control. Mm -hmm. It's a legislative issue. Yep. But when our assessor and our treasurer and all of our elected officials are paying are being paid comfort, uh, wages or salaries complementary to those in Bernalillo County, they have more responsibilities than ours do here, but they're paid a salary that's almost the same. So our legislators, our legislative body has to address that yes. and correct that because it's coming out of the county funds. Yes, I, absolutely. Yeah, there's uh, that law that has been in place, and I, I'm not sure of the citation for it, which allows um, elected officials like assessors, clerks, and uh, sheriffs. Every elected official. Uh, yes, that are full time to work, what is it, eight hours a week? Eight hours every two weeks. That law, that law was enacted when we had these rural communities yes. and a rancher or a farmer would yes. come in and devote one day a week to his job. Absolutely. But, but you law, know what, that, that uh, you're has right. not been changed since what, 19, oh. early 1900s, late 1800s. Yes. And that law needs to be changed. But you as, as officials need to prod your legislators to get that law changed. I agree and we I do. Agree. Uh, we, we have been speaking to our state representatives and we do, we want to see that law change. There's no reason that you should be paid $68,000 a year for showing up for eight hours during the week. You should be the first one there in the morning and the last one there at night. And you should make sure that the people are being served. That's how it should be. And that's not how it has been. It's funny because when we're working on the personnel policy, and I tried kind of sneak this through to the attorneys, and said, how about this? Why don't we put something like either the elected official should be there, and if they're not there, then the appointed, the, the actual chief deputy should be there? You know, and I knew that we couldn't do it, but it's kind of nice just to hope, you know, because you were absolutely right. We're, we're losing a, a, a full-time position. You know, as smaller counties than this, they do work more than 40 hours a week. This is the first time that I've seen this drastic fact. So yes. And the interesting thing is we have to hire assistants to do their job. So they appoint and them. So we, and so that we pay them yep. to do the job that they should be doing, and they're getting peanuts, and they're doing their job. I know Basically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, hello. Hi, Last time you? we had a little bit of a scrap, didn't we? Are we okay? I think so. Oh, are good. We okay? Yeah, we're fine. Awesome. <laughs> I'm just <kidding. laughs> um, So I have, I have a question. Dustin Middleton was telling me that, um, the, the fire marshal, of course, mm -hmm. uh, he was telling me that whenever the ISO ratings go down, mm -hmm. uh, it lowers the insurance yes. rating across the county. Yes. Uh, so how many of his department's ISO ratings have gone down and how much money is that saving the taxpayers? Saving? It's, it's, I don't know how many as in numbers, but you're absolutely right. An ISO rating, you get, te you go and have, if you're ready to, to change your ISO number, if you're a brand new department in a, in a subdivision that have finally got your bylaws, you've got your building, you're at ISO 9. And that means that you have the minimum amount of volunteers, but you have more than 20 buildings, uh, people's houses to protect. And they, and that's a great start because they really receive 70,000 for that on an annual basis. We've had three in the last year and a half to go down to a four and a five. And that's huge because it helps the people 
that pay insurances for their buildings, it, get, it makes them go less. So if you go to State Farm and say, our fire department, our local fire department is an ISO 4, what does that mean? You know, how much money do you, are you going to give back to me or not charge? So yes, you're absolutely right. We have, how many do we have? Um, for the fire department? Yeah. I think, I think it's three. We just, I know Blue Water is now the lowest rating, and which is a fantastic, it's amazing what they've done. Yeah. So yes, you're absolutely right. You've got eight. Eight. So and not only that, it also increases their state fire marshal lobby. So that's it's also a, a plus. It is a plus. It's good. So if you want to go out and say, well, hold a minute, is my insurance, you know, do, should I get a discount? Ask them. You know. So, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. So Paul, go for it. Hi everybody, I'm Paul. I'm the new finance director for Sedona County. And a little bit of background, I worked for seven years at the local government division at the Department of Finance and Administration as a budget analyst. And we provided oversight for municipalities, counties, and special districts. Um, Explain that you were the analyst for City of Grants. Um, I was the city for I was the analyst for City of Grants, the village of Milan. Um, Cibola County at one time, uh, I had a lot of entities on the west side of the state. Um, I was there first from 2008 to 2013 for five years and that's when I worked on all counties, cities and special districts and when I went back uh, I just worked focused on municipalities and I had municipalities around the state so uh, I really understand the DFA reporting requirements and we make sure that we stay on track uh, this fiscal year. Kate was hoping that I could give you guys a little bit of uh, budgeting 101 and um, sort of discuss uh, our current fiscal position. And I know some people had concerns about salaries where, you know, before it was being discussed that, you know, we weren't going to be able to pay our bills at one point in time, but I can assure you that the county looks uh, very healthy. We're looking to have about six months of operating cash in reserves. Uh, we're projected to have that, and uh, we're also looking to maintain that. The local government division requires a 3 twelfths for the general fund reserve. Um, that's mostly due to <laughs> the main revenue sources for a county are property tax, and because of the timing of those, they come in in the late, you know, halfway through the year. Municipalities are more reliant on gross receipts tax. Uh, Mrs. I'll, Fletcher, I'll, I'll it out. she asked Don't me to. Me uh, <laughs> I'll keep you your room again. I also did some contracting, helping entities. Um, I actually worked with Catherine County when Kate was the. Uh, County manager there as well. Um, my kids are out of the house. I had left a little earlier. My son just joined the army, so he's uh, getting basic training right now. So he called. So I stepped out to talk to him for the two minutes that he had. Um, so basically, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been here for a little over two months. Had to come in and totally create a budget to get approved by DFA. Uh, spoke with every department head. Uh, every department, what they asked for, I was able to put it down and- Even the sheriff's office? Even the sheriff's office. Uh, he had some issues before because, um, you know, with the time crunch, we created the budget, but all of his operational expenses were there. Uh, there were some changes to some salary and benefits, but those are what they are, so it reduced his budget a little bit. But he's, uh, you know, most all departments, we budgeted to fill all their vacancies, so they have a budget for that. And uh, it's up to each department to manage their budgets. So we don't want to micromanage. They right. have to know how to manage their own departments. So as I was talking about, to stay on track with revenues for now, uh, you know, the budget, it's a living document. Uh, I was 
stating the main sources of revenue are the GRT and the property tax. So the gross receipts tax, what we did was basically take a three year average and we're gonna be, we're gonna go with that, uh, the E911 program, they increased their gross receipts tax last year. So they didn't receive their first two months of gross receipts tax. So we increased their gross receipts tax projection by 17%. Um, and everything else is status quo. No other uh, taxes have been enacted. Um, so that's sort of how we developed that. The property tax calculations, those are based on formulas. Um, the DFA, they actually create the tax certificates and a lot of the information are based on property tax valuations, which is certified by property tax division. And then we also collect information from, when I worked at DFA, we would collect information uh, from the treasurer's uh, department on their collection rates. And basically, as an analyst, we would mostly look at about, um, because <laughs> the treasurer's department doesn't collect 100% of the taxes that are owed. So that's what the collection rate is. So there's a calculation where you add the valuations and you plug in the uh, collection rates as well as the uh, certificate rates. And that's where I was able to develop that projection from. But as we go through the years, we get actuals, we monitor our projections on revenues, and we get our expenditures in line with those revenues. Um, so that being said, <coughs> uh, Can you explain what kind of tools and resources that you can give the departments, not for micromanaging, but the ability to learn or to understand why it's important to keep an eye on your budget on a monthly basis and find out that you reconcile. Yeah. And, you know, with, uh, with the budget, you know, if, like I said, if revenues aren't uh, uh, coming in, we need to adjust our budget properly. And that can be done because it is a living document. Um, so basically, every department has been given a budget. And like I was saying before, it's their responsibility to manage that budget. Um, with the sheriff's department as an example uh most of most expenditures come from salaries and benefits in the general fund and we'll mostly talk about general fund we've got some departments that are self-sustaining with grants they have their different funds um and uh but as we go through and we monitor this budget we, you know we just gave these raises that they were talking about and they're still constrained by their budget so we haven't done any budget adjustments to increase what was approved. So as of right now, the sheriff has like five uncertified deputy positions that are vacant. So I've developed a tool here where he can plug in. We've got his actual, his officers that are already employed. And you know, he's been complaining that his officers are the lowest paid and now he's got the tools to say, okay, so my officers have been brought up by 10%. His, uh, the other people in his department only got the 4% raise. So we put that all in and basically now he's got a worksheet that he can plug in salaries and to see you know, where he can bring his officers in at to get be a more competitive rate. And it also gives a, like a a percentage of how long that position is going to be filled so that we can actually project where he's going to end up at the end of the year uh, and that way you know if we have to uh, hold off on one position at the end of the year we'll be able to reevaluate see as we go and as we go through the fiscal year we get a cleaner picture of where we actually are and how well the projections were and where we need to adjust so just in FYI, we're going to be monitoring that. Uh, we've got a great team. Uh, as Kate was talking about the appropriations, as uh, you know, Director uh, Rick Lopez at DFA, he only has power over his own department. So 
us being a fiscal agent will only apply for the capital appropriations mm -hmm. and CDBG uh, grants, community development building grants. Well, we're going to try. But the like DOT, they have uh, DOT and, and of transport. Department of Transportation and NMFA, the New Mexico Finance Authority, they rely heavily on DFA's input on the fiscal stability of an entity. So when I was there, they would send a request for financial analysis on an entity, and DFA would give their input, and they would make their decision off that. So it gives us a great leg up oh, yeah. for, other for other departments. Uh, to allow us to be our own fiscal agent. So basically in a nutshell, that's what's going on. We're monitoring uh, everything I'm trying to do. We started up, you know, I've only been here two months to do uh, monthly reporting with all the departments. Um, Mr. Dodds, I'm still catching up with, but um, going forward, I, I spoke with him yesterday. I do have reports available for my departments so they can monitor and track where they're at. Uh, per each account. So we're monitoring all of the funds at the account level. He's being um, too humble. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to add <coughs> something to here. Okay. So this guy okay. comes in and it's like, I'm like, here you go. I've done the preliminary budget. I see there's some money. I'm not sure if this is right because it looks really good, but I'm not a, you know, a finance person. Go look. Fix the budget. Put the budget together. He did it. But not only did he do that, he talked to every single fire department. He spoke to every fire chief, one-on-one -on -one about their budgets. And it was like an eye-opening experience in our department because they'd never really had that before. And his door is always open. He actually actually keeps it open when he should lock it. So his, his <laughs> staff actually christen him and we TP his room when he keeps it open. But anyway, so he's worked so hard. I, I really appreciate having not just a knowledgeable finance director, but someone that is easy to talk to. Because, you know what, we're talking about volunteers as well. We're talking about people that haven't gone to school uh, to know how to run a budget. They're here because they're the fire chief and they've been elected by their community. And we need to give them the resources and tools so they can succeed. And that's this one. And, and I really appreciate, I can guarantee you, if you called and said, can I meet with you, Paul? He will make time and he will meet with you. Sorry, there you go. Right. Thank you. I just have a question. Uh, yes. Several years ago, someone had, you know, as a as a media source, people provide us with comments, and sometimes we try to follow that source to get to the truth of that comment. And so, several years ago, someone mentioned that there was a state law, and I never was able to find the documentation on this, but there was a state law that if we had um, so many youngsters in our community that were receiving free meals at schools, that there was, it benefited the county. I never was able to go to the source of that. And so we have 100% of our youngsters that are getting free meals in our county, and does that help the, the oh. county in any way. I, I don't know. So I'm thinking it's not helping the county, but it, it's not it's not not helping the county. Um, when you have a every year when the school gets together, they have a budget from the state, and they go by the same procurement laws as us. I think it might be, and I'll try to find it for you a statute, but they have emergency funding, and when you have a hundred percent. Uh, families that don't have to pay their lunches, which is a lot of rural schools like this. Once they're in there and they can prove that they need more money to pay for the lunches, then that comes out of SRS. Remember that? Um, the secure, secure rural, rural schools. schools? That's the money that we kind of get with our schools. So we get a certain amount <coughs> and the schools get a certain amount. So that formula changes if they have 100% poverty. Not poverty, but people using free lunches. And there's a big, you know, you have to do a lot of, do that's good to have 100%. So I think that's where it's coming from. So helping the, helping the community, but helping the county, because we have SRS as well, so it's a formula that we base it together. 
So we get it for our roads, but they get it for their school funding. So emergency funding for them. So is that a federal? It's a federal. It is a federal, mm -hmm. not a state. Not state. That's what I want to clarify. It's a federal, okay. yes. And we have, there's a lot of, uh, I was also a budget analyst for HSD, the Human Services Department, and I manage their income support division uh, program. And you know, they have a lot of programs in there, so I'm not sure what specific uh, program that is that you're talking about, but the state manages a lot of federal programs as well. So you can look into uh, possibly the Forest Reserve, which is the Secure Rural Schools, or uh, some statutes maybe involving the Human Services Department and their programs. I guess my real, the bottom line was, does it benefit the county? And that was what I really yes, wanted I, to know. Yes, you know what, I think, I, I can't be sure for this, but I think it does because the formula changes. So if we have more, if we have more proof that we need help, i.e. the schools, then it helps us in the percentage of the formula. But let me do a little bit more research on that, if that's okay, and I'll get back to you. Yes. Uh, yeah, so when, when we first started talking about PILT, we, we did touch on SRS yes. uh, briefly. Mm -hmm. So what, what is going on with that? I, I know we're getting money from PILT, but are we also getting money from SRS? Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. How much? Do we know? Yep. Yeah, well, PILT, that's payment in lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. Those are um, uh, county lands like the, the National Forest where the federal government isn't paying taxes. Uh, so we're not, the county's getting shorted on uh, taxing those lands so the federal government gives a, a, a supplement, I guess, based on- Yeah, depends on how much land we have federally that we can't tax anybody because they can't live on it. And with PILT, we, we received, uh, Last year, it was, uh, or the year before, was 1.6 million. This past, uh, on June, in the end of June, in last fiscal year, but we're using it for this year, uh, we received $2.1 million in PILT. And so that, that's a big gap, $500,000. So really that's something us. we really have to monitor. That's another huge revenue source. That might go away. That it's we all, get threatened every two years that it's going to go away. That's so, authorized in Congress. Up in Washington. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it always comes down to the end. We're waiting to see is it going to be reauthorized or not. If we lose that funding, that's going to that, that, that'll be huge. That'll be huge. And, and we, we're actually in a, a court case we've signed up. Um, there's about, I think, 11 counties that uh, did not, they're saying that we did not receive, this county did not receive an, the right amount, the formula was incorrect. So they're going back five years and there's about, I think, 11 or 12 counties that have actually signed on to this um, <coughs> claim, this uh, court case. And if, if we do win, the county will, this county will receive another 76,000. So we have to be... I'm learn, I learn every year about PILT and SRS because the formulas and I'm, you know, I don't think it's fair. I'm just going to do a spiel. So think about this. So Catron, just for example, we have thousands and thousands of, of, you know, PILT. We should be getting lots of PILT because it's all forest, right? But because of the formula, we get 23 cents an acre, all right? because of the formula. Lee County, who's south, got some money, got federal land. They don't have as much as any, any of us, but their average is at $3.38 an acre. So the formula in Washington needs to be addressed, and that's what we're trying to do, especially with this uh, claim. It should not be about the population. It should be about how fair is it for a small county like this one to only receive, I think we're at 87 cents an acre. It kind of goes back and forth, but last year we were at 87 cents. So that just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, a county that is needing more money to, to do economic development, to bring in people, and we're getting 23 cents, 87 cents, when another county is receiving millions from GRT, and they're also getting Three dollars and something something cents, and you know, for pilt. So it's wrong, and and I know that every year more senators and congressmen find this out and learn, and so it's a, a continual 
discussion that we, we do, we go to, and we talk about. So, yeah. I mean, Paul, you had commented that we don't collect 100% on our property taxes. Mm -hmm. What percent, on average, do we collect, and how do we compare to like other counties? 92. Uh, how would compare to other counties? Uh, I don't have that data with me. That is on the DFA website. You can check any county you would like. Uh, for us, we had a collection rate of, of the past three years of 92.35%. Pretty good. An average on counties this size is around 92. So, yeah. Okay. It's really good. And then um, another question I have, and when you first started, I think I had asked this. So, the county has property and land. Mm -hmm. And you said it would take a while to kind of inventory all that. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that's going. Yeah, well, actually, we're working on that too. So, <clears throat> because it, everything that we pay for, it's taxpayers' yeah, money. It's your money. So, we can't just sell it. You know, we can't just sell property and go, oh yeah, I know Joe down the road, he wants it. Doesn't happen that way. So we have to do the certain things that we do. I have got an inventory and I've also got an auction list. And we're kind of trying to figure out how to keep the auction. We have to do, we can't give anything away either. All right, so we have to try to get some money back for the taxpayers. So I found out yesterday, Dustin told me that, how many fire trucks did you say? Uh, Okay. The fire trucks, I wasn't aware of oh. as of yet. I, I knew the road department and uh, the sheriff's department have some assets that they want to dispose of, but I haven't talked with Dustin about that. And, and one of the findings we have had for multiple years is they didn't do the auction correctly. They just missed a step, and, and it's they missed the step of you have to write a letter to the state auditors saying we are we are planning on doing an auction and this is what we're auctioning off. They don't give us approval, we can do that, but we have to prove that we've writ written to them so they see it, and it, then we can do the auction 30 days after they receive that letter. And, so. Yeah, and one of my responsibilities at DFA was the disposition of property and to give approval for counties and municipalities. Um, that's why it's, uh, you know, you need to find out fair market value or has it been depreciated. Uh, those values of the property that you're selling um, depend, that makes the difference on whether you just notify the state auditor or you have to get approval from DFA. If it's like you're within a certain value, if it's real property, then you need to go board of finance with DFA. So uh, it's really important to get your listing and VIN numbers, and that's values. what we're working on. And that's what we're working on to determine uh, how we are going to dispose of this property. And then we follow we're also the, the another, statutes as yes, well. Yes, but we're also, okay. another finding that we've had multiple, like repeat, 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 that we've already, we know about, is the actual asset inventory. How much does the county have? What is, what are our assets? And we've, we've, we're working together to get all that together. But it's such a big county and it's never been done correctly. Um, I'm hoping the commission will approve a quote that I'm putting in, in their desk, on their desk to approve, um, to actually have a company to come in and do it right. Um, we, I know, I look at the history about this county and, and we've tried to do it many times with the people that we have and it doesn't work. We just need to do it right. You know, let's get our assets, let's figure out how much money we we're about and then move forward. So yes, that's what we are working on. Auction, assets, everything. Thank you. Okay, I, I have something that a lot of people don't understand is just because we, we live in Cibola County doesn't mean that you can give out a backup to Cerroeta or, or San Rafael. Everything has to be said to the state, okay? A lot of people say, well, let's just do it. No, you just can't. You get yourself in trouble. Absolutely. You have a surplus right. uh, procurement website that you can go on actually uh there is you know it's it, it depends if it's in the best interest of the county mm -hmm. like say you've got a fire department on the outskirts in, in another county but near uh Siebel county oh, yeah. that would benefit okay. Okay. Uh, people on the outskirts so if it's in the best if it's in the best interest to give a fire truck to donate one um or sell a surplus Government to government, 
then you know it, it could be allowable, but then there's approval from DFA. That's what I'm saying. It's still needs approval go. regardless. Yeah, and it's it's actually another anti-donation yes. clause. Right. I'm going to jump, um, and I'm dealing with this on a nearly a daily basis with this issue, and we're all learning. So bear with us because by law, county employees and county equipment cannot go onto private property. I would love it if we could because we could help so many people with their driveways and their roads and everything because, you know, that's, we cannot, whether we want to or not, we are not allowed because that's the anti-donation clause. So it's really hard and I'm having, not a hard time, but it's a hard one to digest when you haven't really been taking it that, you've been, we've been getting findings for that anti-donation clause. So one step at a time. Uh, commissioners are understanding and road crew so and everyone I mean it is I opened the door and I was like ah that didn't happen no I didn't see it that's what I do on a daily basis because it doesn't really matter what happens there but we need ignorance is bliss I wish I didn't know because then I could just say oh yeah but I do know and I know that we can't we can't do that and, oh, what is the status of the greenhouse <laughs> Oh, okay, the greenhouse is, actually, it's okay right now. We have received our taxes, they, they wrote checks. We, we did uh, wonder, but we waited until they got cleared and they were cleared. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that on our end, as tax, property tax, we are working uh, with their attorney and they have, they're nearly up to date. They've got one more year, I think they're there. And then also I know the city of Grants, because it's actually in the city, so we really don't have any, county doesn't have any control over it because we just do the taxes, the property tax. I know the city has been, do you want to add something? Um, our office uh, of code enforcement has gotten in touch with uh, CEO of uh, Bright Green, uh, John Stockwell, and uh, through his lawyer. And we asked that they clean up the property of all the dumps. We did not go on the property because uh, it's, not legal but uh, with a telephoto lens I was able to take pictures and of the different dumps uh, that they have on the property and uh, uh, styrofoam that's all over the place and Mr. Stockwell has assured me he has hired a contractor who's going to come in they have uh, I've been told tens of thousands of plates of glass in there and he's hiring a firm to come in to clean the property all around and remove the dumps, the offending dumps, and all the garbage and trash and weeds around the area, and to replace um, broken glass in the greenhouses. Uh, I just got word yesterday that um, they would like, uh, like to get something going uh, real soon. And so, you know, that's up to Mr. Stockwell, and, and regardless of what has been printed or said, the city of Grants does not break the law. Everything that we do, we follow the law. Uh, when it comes to demolitions of private property, I do not go in there and just randomly say, we're taking this property and we're tearing it down. We go through a very lengthy process because we do not want liability upon our city. And it drives me crazy, because it's like you have to wait and wait. Well, and, and that's how government is, but, but we do that. And, uh, you know, work with people, give everybody an opportunity. This is still America. When they own property, it is their property. And we can't just randomly say, oh, we want this or we want that, and then take it. That's, that's not right. I know at the last uh, city council meeting, um, the mayor asked uh, Chief Hayes, and he said he also had asked you to go and search for code violations at the at the jail. Okay. Uh, the mayor got excited. Um, he, the mayor, does not deal with the day-to-day -day dealings of the city you know, or the different departments within the city. That department is my department, and I do. There are certain things that we cannot do. The fire chief cannot go onto that property, uh, being private property, and um, 
I do not go on that property because it's private property. But we do have laws in place to protect the citizens and, and we're using those laws uh, like we do with anyone else. Um, we do want the greenhouse cleaned up for one of the main reasons is it's right next to our golf course, which we have this beautiful golf course. It looks like Ireland. And um, you've got the greenhouse next door that has thousands of pieces of styrofoam that every time we have a windstorm blows all over the golf course. And, and you know, and when I became aware of that, that's when I've gotten in touch with, with John Stockwell. It's not because the city wants it. The city doesn't want it. The city doesn't operate businesses. Um, that's, that's not proper for any government entity to do. And so all we care about is the, the cleanliness and the safety of the property to the community. And, and that's how we feel about any property. And trust me, I deal, I have um, seven different properties that are on, on the demolition list that we're going through the process. And it is a long process. And, and sometimes the mayor gets upset with me because it doesn't get done yesterday. But um, uh, we must follow the law and we must go through the steps and then we won't have any liability issues or uh, lawsuits, you know. I, Terry. I just want to ask Kate, you said that I know the last two checks cleared, but that only paid us up to the settlement, which is over four years old. That is correct. What about the, how much taxes does he owe us for the last four years? Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. Because of all this mess, and because it was such a delinquent thing, we, we actually already put that property on the list for delinquent taxes for them to sell. And so it got really close to let PTD handle it. And they are very aware of it. They've been aware of this. We have meetings on a, they know every gritty detail that's been going on with um, this, this case. So yes, they do, but they also have laws. And their statute book that he gave me to read, which is great, thanks a lot, buddy. You know, it's like this thick, and there's a statute for everything. So like I said, like, you know, Commissioner, sorry, Mr. Windhorst um, is absolutely correct. There are so many things that we have to do. We don't have any right. We, we've got to make them, they're allowed to do their process. And so we need to just figure out if they're, when they're late, we put them back on the list. But we cannot do that because it's already been taken care of by PTD. They're absolutely aware of what happened by a settlement agreement that the, the county did with that certain amount of money. They agreed to that and there's some more money that's supposed to be coming in the next couple of months. So I'm saying this as a, it's a hurry up and wait, but there's more entities involved with this rather than just the county, the owner, and the city. It is, it's no, the PTD, the Penalty Tax Division, you say greenhouse and they cringe. So I'm telling you, everybody kind of knows what's going on, but we have to follow the process, just like Mr. Windhorse explained. We know how much? How much they owe us for after it, the settlement. It actually depends on what's the penalties. So, because there's been late penalties, but they're actually up to date. They've got one more, they did to 15, 16, 17, yes. So you can only put a property, and I might be, I don't want to say, you can only, is it three years? Yeah, it's three years. It's three years, right? So. If they're late in paying, you can put the property back on the list. But well, we've given them an assessment oh, yeah. for the last four years oh, yeah. that are part of the settlement. Yes. Uh, so do you have any idea how much money they owe us for those? I think it's like, what is it? It's, it's like two altogether? Right. I think it's two. I'm not too sure because attorneys have been involved now, so we really don't have the um, information because because we're working with their attorneys and as soon as they say the word attorneys our legal gets involved so I get updates or we get updates in our executive session. Our May session. I say something more yes. about the greenhouse? Um, in defense of the mayor, um, the mayor, one of his responsibilities as an elected official is economic development and and on his part he has seen an empty greenhouse sitting here deteriorating 
And I think he's been frustrated about that because there is opportunity there if, if the right opportunity comes. But right now, it must come from the owner, John Stockwell. And, and uh, so that's what was on the mayor's mind. Economic development, being able to use, um, use the property for something rather than nothing. I mean, you have a huge building. You have, you have uh, acres, 20 acres of greenhouse. Uh, it's just a shame that it's been sitting here for I don't know how many years, uh, 18 years? Eight, 18 years sitting there, and and it has been a blight um, in this area with the golf course. Every golfer um, mentions it, you know, when they get down to that end of the golf course and they see it. And so that was on the mayor's mind. Let me find out the actual amount, and I'll let you know if you if you if I get your phone number because I think I don't want to say a false amount. Yeah, I understand. But I can definitely find One out. One of the problems there is he's contesting the rate we tax him at because he's not an operating business. And I don't know if we've resolved that issue, I but what he should have been taxed at I for the last four years that are part of the settlement. I think the settlement, yeah, I think the settlement agreement that we have, and please bear with me because I've only been here for a short time, and I'm hearing this nightmare that's gone on for years and years and years, but once the county was put into a settlement agreement and the commission direct to approve the settlement agreement with their attorneys. I, we don't have much say. Um, it's the attorneys to attorneys that actually have to work on the, the cost. But I, I'll find out the exact amount from 15 to, to 18 to find out how much they owe. Is and that, that was it? actually decided before I got elected. So. <laughs> this is off the topic. Um, I serve on two boards. One is the Animal Care Center and the other is the Grants Community Pantry. Both of those organizations need volunteers. They're desperate for people to help. Um, I know that the budget for the Animal Care Center is over $300,000. In one day only, they picked up 11 stray dogs in the city. That doesn't include the county. It doesn't include the village of Milan. It does. They also have an animal care control person out of Laguna Acoma. They bring theirs in. Sometimes they have 70 dogs in one day, and uh, they're overwhelmed, but they need volunteers. And our community pantry had been started by those of you that were here years ago by uh, Reverend um, Reuben Thomas. Uh, the churches had all contributed volunteers to the program, and many of those churches are no longer involved, uh, sending volunteers, and so, uh, they serve, there's some days when they serve a hundred people that come in, especially around the first of the month, and there are two people there that are on a regular basis. They have two other, sometimes three other people that come in to volunteer, and they need volunteers. Um, so if you know of someone, if your church wants to be active in this, in this uh, endeavor, keep in mind that uh, we have probably one of the best uh, directors for our local pantry that we've had since Ruben Thomas left. So, but they need help and they need volunteers. So if you're willing to come in and, and do your part, they would welcome that. Also, if you're involved in an agency that provides community service, they need communi those community service, uh, those that are required to do community service, if you would send them to the pantry or to the animal care center, they would welcome them as well. Uh, speaking of volunteering, there is a cleanup in Milan this uh, coming Saturday, <coughs> starting at 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and um, uh, everyone's invited to come and help. And then Grants will have their community cleanup the first Saturday of October, uh, the Track for Trash. And we will have dumpsters placed throughout the city for cleaning up, and then uh, we will have volunteers together to do some. Uh, special projects during that time. And on the 20th, which is a Saturday, Main Street plans on, on going over to the uh, Charlie's Radiator uh, property and working on the Los Alamitos lot, uh, cleaning it and uh, making it more presentable. 
the city went in and we did cut down the uh, elms that uh, were over by the shop and and some hedges uh, and uh, we're trying to get permission from the owner uh, Joe Diaz to um, to paint the building I have one other thing that I'd like to bring yeah, up because it's kind of important that everybody trust you know you talk about sheriff's office and DWI and all our funds that we have it goes both ways and I think this county is how it needs to learn how to trust again I think there's been things that have happened in the past that they feel they don't trust our office and so I just want to let you know that that's one of my goals they have we have to trust one another you know DWI he has to trust me when we're talking about certain projects sheriff everyone treasurer clerk assessors but this goes both ways I have to trust them and they have to trust us and if I could add uh, on to that yeah you know coming in not having any political affiliation with, with uh, you know this area um, you know, I want to really commend as a county the commissioners and them directing all of the, uh, like when they get requests from department heads to go through the county manager. This way it can be properly funneled uh, and their addresses can be, uh, or their concerns can be addressed. Um, and we are working with each department, uh, you know, I am working closely with Deanna, the um, ad admin assistant with the sheriff's department to help. You know, sometimes uh, for someone to understand, it just needs to be said a different way. And I'm hoping to uh, have Deanna really help out with getting an understanding between the sheriff's department and the county. Um, and we're here to help them and we're here, we're here to help every department and get them reports and so that we're all successful as a, as a county. I want to thank Kate and Paul, uh, not only for the great work they're doing within our county, but reaching out to the other government entities, the City of Grants and the Village of Milan. Paul offers his expertise to help because we are, everyone is interconnected. We all help one another. We're, we're all brothers and sisters, so to speak, and um, I am grateful for what they have done. I'm so grateful for the attention to detail that, that, that Kate has had. Um, her experience has made such a tremendous difference in our, our county. I can remember not being able to sleep for, for months every night bothered waking up at two in the morning looking at my awful ceiling and 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 thinking about all the messes and and how do we fix them how do we fix them and i'm so grateful to have gotten an experienced manager and an experienced financial director who know what to do and i think we're blessed for that to trust as well the commissioners trust me and I and I hope I know actually but they're learning too you've got to remember they didn't know there, there's been weak management and I don't mean they did they were wrong it's just there's rules that change through the years you have to stay up on it and and, and commissioner and managers department we have to work really well together we have to I have to know exactly what they're thinking if I don't then I'm not doing my job and vice versa you know they come in different I know I see them I know when they come in you know it's one-on-one -on -one, but I learn a lot and I'm enjoying it and I thank you very much for oh, you're welcome I that. and Laura would want me to say thank you to all of you for for coming today um, I want you to know I work with Laura Haramio she's a good manager and and she cares about about our city and I know the mayor does too and our city council I know because Manny, wherever I am, I, I can, Manny's right there, right alongside, I'll be at the side of the road, and he pulls up and joins me. And this happens a lot. So, uh, so grateful to be part of this community. Thank you for all of you for being here today.